Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the time that we have to study your word, the truths that have unfolded uh, before us in the past and that are unfolding presently as we move through history, as we approach the coming of our Lord and Savior. We just pray, Lord, that um, we can be faithful in the little things that you've given us to do, that we can trust in your providences, that we can joy in the trials that we, we encounter in our lives that create a greater dependence upon you. We ask, Lord, that um, your Holy Spirit can be here, and that you can be with those that couldn't make it here this morning. Just ask that you can be with them. We pray that you can speak to our hearts, that you can transform our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again, everyone. Now, um, and I'm just going to bring up the point that uh, Stephen and I were talking about prior to um, this study. So he, he had a question regarding uh, the fall of Babylon in five on October 13th, 539. And there is a document called uh, the Analytic Tablet of Cyrus. And, and that is just another name for the Nabonidus Chronicle. And originally when it was transcribed, they misread the month Tishritu, the seventh month, as Tammuz, the fourth month. And, you know, it was a debate that went on for a little bit with some people regarding uh, what was the correct reading. Uh, but A.T. Jones has Babylon fall in 538 in uh, in the month of Tammuz, which is in the summer rather than in the fall of 539. And um, so there's some people that still hold to these views. And the reason why I bring it up, it's not just that Stephen brought it up, but one of the things that we've talked about is attention to detail and how, how important it is. And that came up in a previous study that we were doing, reading uh paper of a guy named Glenn, um, where he didn't, he, he thought, you know, we don't want to deal with minutia. And as we go through here in First Samuel, and we, we're going to begin putting this on a line, um, I'm not sure exactly when, but the details matter, right? And often we can get led down a wrong course because of some assumption or some detail that, that is missed. And, you know, how, how do we deal with that problem? Like, we don't know everything, right? None of us knows everything. None of us, we hardly know anything. So how does God lead us? So it's just a simple question. How does God lead us to know truth? How do we sort through all this mess? Line upon line. Okay. Yeah, so, so there are things we, we do, right? God has given us directions of how to study. But we know that, that the most important thing is to be obedient to the truth. And that God actually leads us. If we were left to our own devices, would we come to a knowledge of the truth? No. Yeah, so no amount of intellect, no amount of learning can actually is actually responsible for us knowing truth. It has to do with obedience to God. And sometimes we, we get that confused. And so our characters are the most important aspect of understanding God's word. Correct? Agreed. And, and um, you know, that's the thing that uh, I, I guess bothers me the most <laughs> in that uh, when you want to, to share the truth with someone, you're not just dealing with some intellectual ideas, right? You're dealing with a person. And um, one of the things I think that that we see here, that I've seen here anyway, in looking at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we're, we're dealing with, and I, I think that it's starting to form, at least in my mind, of how this is going to be structured, that... You know, Eli's his sons of Belial, his worthless sons. You know, we can we can sort of focus that as as you know someone else, but in reality, we are all sons of Belial. We're all worthless 
in and of ourselves, right? It's God that makes us valuable. And how we treat the service of the sanctuary, the study of God's word, ministering to others, it has to have no selfishness in it. And and the basic problem that they had was their selfishness. All of that uh, destroyed everything that, that God had given. And so it's not knowing enough. They, they obviously knew God's requirements, but they didn't obey them. Okay, so we're, we're going to read over this section again. Now, um, one thing I just want to note, this little paragraph marking here, you see. Right, so this is another section, right, when we, when we get here. And when we move through, uh, let me see, we're going to have quite a bit of stuff dealing with this. But you're going to see verse 18 is a different section. And then, and then verse 22. So we have this section, um, verse 21, 20, 19, 18, what is it again? Let's go back here, and it's going to be at verse 12. So we got verse 12 to verse right, 21, correct? And then, or 22, and then we have a new section. Did, where was that marking? Is it 21? Yeah, so 21. Now, of course, you know, these paragraph markings, they, they have to do with uh, manuscripts from which these are copied. But if we multiply 12, 12 by 21, what do we get? So we're, we're studying a section from verse 12 to verse 21. 252. Yeah, we get 252. So are we going to take that as significant in guiding us? The Lord always puts things into his word for a purpose. Okay. Yeah, now we know, of course, the verse, the verses, uh, the numbering of the verses is something that man added. But God, in his providence, has allowed these symbols to exist. And he's directing us presently, as we're studying these verses, uh, to see some of these symbols. Now, the other thing uh, which just comes to mind, when we dealt with the 777 structure, we had this Mayan calendar that was on uh, December 21st, 2012, that, that starts that structure. It's going to end December 25th, 2021, right? This is this, this structure that we had with the, where I showed all the failed predictions dealing with first the mind calendar prediction. And of course, the 21st day of the 12th month is what? 21 and 12, 21 times 12, 252. And, and we can see how then, uh, it also ends, it begins in 2012 and ends in uh, 2021, right? So this would relate to this message in the context of that line. Does that seem fair? Or am I skipping too many steps for people? It would seem logical, but you might want to explain your steps anyway. Okay. So... The steps here is I'm taking this story of dealing with Eli, Eli's sons to actually refer to this movement. And that is I'm taking this, this prophetic mirror, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, we had from December 21st, 2012, 777 days to my 52nd birthday. And then another 777 days later, we had then a, uh, and then we had September 23rd. 777 days before November 9th, and then we have from November 9th, 2019, 777 days to December 25th, uh, 2021, right? So maybe I should show people the diagram, Let's see if I can, how quickly I can find it. This is part of it, but this is not the whole thing. So where is the other diagram? That's going to be here. Okay, so these diagrams look a little bit complex. And some of these are a bit messed up because they got messed up when I changed the file. So December 21st, 2012, the world was supposed to end. That's the 13th back tune, right? And if you go from the beginning of the Miley calendar on August 11th, 3113 BC, according to the Gregorian date, to December 21st, 2012, that's a period of 1,872,000 days. So it has the symbol there of July 18, 2020, 1872 or 18720, that is that um, 
uh, Mayan calendar symbolism that leads us to to understanding confirm, confirming what we had is that date. So one eight seven two zero. That's the main symbol there, and uh, you can see here that. Uh, um, my 52nd birthday on February 6, 2015, that's 52 years. And uh, 52 times 360 is 18720, right? So, and anyway, we start here on December 21st, 2012, and we end December 25th, 2021. We have two periods of 777 days on either side, right? And this originally comes from uh, the structure that Jeff found with the Levitical chiasm, right? So this, this chiasm is based upon that. So first he finds the Levitical chiasm, and then I find this structure. So this is a period in which this movement was being tested. Now, remember the December 21st, 2012 date is exactly the center of two dates that Jeff talked about, and that was June 22nd, 2000 and um, 2011, right? That's when he's going to receive that money to start the School of the Prophets, $165,000. And then we have June 22nd, 2014, when they have the first camp meeting in Arkansas after they have established the School of the Prophets, even though the camp meeting isn't at the school, it's at Lambert Church, but still. Okay, that makes sense to people that there's these two dates, and exactly center of that is December 21st, 2012. And then we can see that the center of this chiasm is June 22nd, 2017. So we got the 2011, the 2014, and the 2017, June 22nd. We also later, in 2020, we had a June 22nd as well. That's when the message of July 18, 2020 went worldwide, right? So that June 22nd becomes a symbol of a certain aspect of this movement, right? Dealing with, with time. And we also, June 22nd is 622. Uh, in 622 of the creation of the world, what occurs on, on 622 AM, Anno Monday? Who's born then? Stephen should know this. Maybe he's not able to hear. So I believe it's the birth of Enoch, right? And then there's going to be the 65 years and the 187 years and then the birth of Lamech and the 777 days. So you have 252 years from the birth of Enoch to the birth of Lamech, right? With the uh, 65 and 187 in there. We also have uh, 622 BC. What happens in 622 BC? Anybody know? So 622 BC is going to be the Passover of Josiah, right? And that's going to be where Ezekiel counts from when he says in the 30th year, in the fifth year of the captivity, in the 30th year, the 30th year. So he's in 592 and he's talking about 622 BC. What about 622 AD? What is that? What happens at sunset on July 18, 622 AD. Anybody know or remember? Yeah, so that's going to be the Islam calendar. If you take the propoleptic, propoleptic, <laughs> yes, I think that's the right word, uh, calendar, because obviously the calendar hadn't been created at that time, but that's going to be in the year of the Hij Hijra. So their calendar starts at sunset, June 20 or July 18, uh, 622. So you have those two symbols. Uh, 622 and um, and July 18 coming together in the Islamic calendar, right? So you got that symbol 622 all through this, and uh, we also see it in Millerite history. So what's on June 22nd in Millerite history, 1844, June 22nd? Yeah, so that's uh, Samuel Snow's, as it is, third letter is yes. written. Is yeah, David so that David? And it's Pentecost. Yes. Right? Yeah. And it'll be published June 27th, which is uh, the 11th day of the third month. And if you double the 11th day of the third month, you get 622, right? So it's one of these little neat little puzzles that were was put there um, dealing with the doubling, right? So, so I'm saying that 
that when we have 21 and 12, as we have in these verses from Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2, and we can think of 2.12 as 20.12, and we can think of 2.21 as 20.21, but this is referring to the history of this movement in a similar fashion when we looked in Judges, and we looked at chapter 2, and we saw that that gave a history of the movement from 9-11 to 20-23. Does that seem fair to people, my analysis here, that, that I'm saying that this Sons of Belial is addressing this movement in that history? And remember, on December, 25th, 20, uh, December 21, 2012, I was giving a presentation on the 25-20. Uh, I didn't think about any of this stuff, of course, back then regarding... Uh, any of the structure or the significance of that date. And that's the date I met Heidi as well. She came to that Bible study. So uh, no, 627, 1844 is the, is, yeah, so that's the sixth day of the third month. So June 22nd, 1844 is the sixth day of the third month, which is Pentecost. And June 27th, which is five days later, is the 11th day of the third month, just responding to Angela's uh, comment in the chat. So if I take, so if I take her question, she says, isn't 622, 18.44, the 11th day of the third month? No. So it's the sixth day of the third month. And then it's published on June 27th, which is the 11th day of the third month. And then if you double the 11th day of the third month, you get 622, right? Right, the 22nd day of the third month doubled is the 20, or the 11th day of the third month doubled is the 22nd day of the sixth month, which is the date the letter was written on. Does that make sense, Angela? Or anyone doesn't understand that? Yes, I'm just trying to un unscramble my brain here. <laughs> so, so the idea that 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 I'm, I was going to ask you what that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. There's a line going up before before the February sixth. On, yeah, on the first first uh, drawing there, I was wondering what that was. Yeah, this line here is just should be uh, oh, yeah. here. Okay. Just thank you. Because I changed the the format of the files a couple of years ago, and so some of these they because I made it to a wide screen, and it things that were outside of the screen just got pushed off to the sides. So that would just be there. It's just marking the top part. I'm pretty sure that's where that goes. I don't see where else it could go. Could be wrong. Maybe it was meant to be somewhere else. Oh, yeah, I know where it's supposed to go. No, no, that's where it goes. Unless I meant it to go here. Could be where. Yeah, that's where it goes. Seventy, Because there's 77 days. That's for my first presentation, October 5th, 2012. And and then there's 77 days to December 21st, 2012, and then 126 days to April 26, 2013, and then yeah, there's anyway, there's a bunch of different symbols in there, uh, which we'll just leave out for now. Anyway, my proposal is similar to the proposal that I made regarding Judges chapter two. I'm saying that this section of the Sons of Belial is talking specifically to us about this movement in that period of time. Does that seem reasonable? Have I have I given enough evidences for that? I mean, it's pretty tough to look at our movement here as represented by Hoffnei and Phinehas, at least some aspect of our movement. Now, of course, you know, we, we have these long pauses which get edited out of the video those who are wondering if I give people enough time to speak. It's a pretty long pause. Can somebody comment on this? I know you like time to think. Um, Job 15, 16. Job 15, 16. Okay, Job 15, 16. For those, those of us who saw How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water? So we're all flawed. We all have sins. We all have defects we need to get rid of. It's a constant challenge. And we can't hide from it. People try to hide from it. You may as well face it and cut it out. Ask the Lord to excise these things from, from us, you know. 
I mean, I'm fed up with my faults and sins. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing that's going to, if, if we look at this, this is God correcting his, his movement, his church, right? We can see that there's this message, right? Which we're going to say that Samuel represents a message. Okay. Or, or some aspect of a message of this movement, right? But we also have the sons of Belial, which the wheat and tares grow together till the harvest. Now, we know that we're going to have uh, uh, in in uh, well in 2012. So a thing that's not not really dealt with. And I don't know the exact date. I could probably find it out, actually, uh, when Tabo moved in with me. So he moved in in 2012. Pretty sure it was in May of 2012. Uh, could have been in April, April or May of 2012. He moved in with me. And, um, you know, he at that time was not, you know, not an elder. He wasn't a, a leader in the movement. He was a part of Future News Canada. He had been put on their board. So, you know, as, as far as Tavo is concerned, he was a young guy, inexperienced, put, given too much responsibility too soon and uh, easily misled. He did, hadn't developed much of an Adventist experience. He'd only been an Adventist for a very short period of time. Uh, didn't really understand Adventism. And, you know, God, of course, could have fitted him for the work if he had, this is my human judgment, right? But if he had yielded to the Holy Spirit, if he had been teachable, but he wasn't very teachable. And, you know, he was he was more political than anything on how he dealt with people. And, and if anybody could have seen how he treated me when he lived with me, uh, they never would have made him elder. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty evident to me. But, you know, people didn't live with him. And he didn't respect me because I wasn't wealthy. It was basically it. If I had lots of money, he would have treated me very differently because I saw how he treated people who had power or money. And, and I didn't. I was living in uh, my son's business, right? You know, on a you know, landscaping business, it was a house, but you know, it was I didn't have the whole house, and and Tabo didn't really have that respect for me because of it, right? I didn't appear to have power in the movement. He looked for those that had influence and those he would suck up to, and this is just you know me judging another person. So I'm not you know saying that you should listen exactly to what I say, but this was my experience, and um, uh, so that's in in 2012. And what we see here, I mean, if, if I was going to describe Tabo, I, I would say that he was worthless. And that, that's a really hard thing for me to say about somebody. Because I, I have nothing against Tabo as a person. I don't hate him. I'm not resentful. Um, uh, I cared for him and I wanted him to do well. But he just did not have any practical experience in life. He, he had been pandered to his whole life and he didn't know what it meant to have hardship or heartbreak, really. You know, he just hadn't had any experience. He was he, he was young. He was, I, I think, at the time, 25 when he moved in with me in 2012. And when he was put in a position as leader, we tried everything we did to help him and to support him. But it just went to his head and. The parallel between Tabo and Saul uh, should be evident to some people. Is it evident? How, how tall was Tabo? Anybody remember how tall he is? Well, Pretty he tall. has to be close to seven feet tall because I have a son six four, and he's taller than him. Yeah, so he, he's pretty tall. At six six something, any well six eight at least six nine six ten well, maybe. He's well, pretty. Six, I know. Six, it's, I'm six two, and he stood. I know, I know, a head length, a head uh, taller than I did. Okay, now we see that with Saul as well, which we will see. You know, I mean, I mean, somebody might say that's just a super superficial comparison, and and you know, obviously he doesn't become the king. You know, Parminder is going to be the one who's going to be the leader, but people judge by appearances, and. Uh, Tabo also had the ability to use a lot of big words that he didn't know what they meant, but neither did the people listening to him. So he he had a way of talking that people thought he was intelligent, but you know he's just of average intelligence. He wasn't uh, 
brilliant by any stretch. But people went by appearances. And it is true that taller people can be elevated to positions higher than they should be, with a lot of pun intended there, right? So, so we can see here at that time in 2012 that there's a problem and the problem that exists within the movement, which exists within us. And this, this could be, I mean, obviously, Tavo's parents, you know, they probably did what they thought was best for him. But we can look more at what the movement did in taking Tavo and placing him in a position of responsibility that he was, right? So he was easily manipulated and used by others. He didn't have the insight that he needed. And, and so this isn't really about Tavo, right? I mean, obviously, I'm using Tavo here as an example. Within the movement existed a spirit that was where people were trying to exalt themselves into positions as if that really matters, right? Instead of taking care of the little details and being faithful in the little things of life, they wanted the big things. And we see this in human nature, right? We see it in ourselves. We shun the, the humble, you know, unthankful tasks and we seek, you know, uh, to be exalted in the spotlight for achievements that really we don't deserve. Right. Can people agree with me on this one? It's a good correlation. So, so this isn't about Tavo. This is about us. This is about this movement. And, and we've pointed it out many times before in various ways. But, but this description here about these sons of Belial and, and their actions aptly, aptly present what this movement had tried to accomplish. So, and, and what it didn't accomplish, I guess. The priest custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest servants came while the flesh was in seething with flesh hooks of three teeth in his hand. So what would be this flesh hook with three teeth? So it's a fork, right? Of some, some sort. Testing process. Okay, so it's got th three, three, three uh, yeah, the three angels' messages. Okay. Three step te testing yeah, three process. Step. Yeah, but so is, three testing prophetic message. Yeah, Dwight. Is this really something that is of God, or is this something that is of man? Well, I mean, it is of God. They they need to have this flesh hook to take uh, when you when you see um, some of the offerings when you boil them, right? You need a flesh hook, How, but, okay, it's, but it's going to be misused. I I always thought that this was giving us a representation of something that was not in accordance with the sacrifice. You're saying that they don't boil it? <clears throat> no, that the the three hooks that the priests are using is not something of the sacrifice. Yeah, I, I think it is. But um, what would you base that on? Well, I'm just, all, all I'm trying to do is consider. I, I'll see if I can come up with something quickly. Yeah, okay. Um, so let me see here. Okay, so just trying to get some of these references. Uh, we got Exodus 29, 27, and 28. So this is dealing with the wave offering. And thou shalt sanctify the breast of the wave offering and the shoulder of the heave offering, which is waved, which is heaved up, of the ram of the consecration, even that which is for Aaron and of that which is for his sons. And, and it shall be Aaron's and his sons by statute forever. Okay, so this is dealing with um, this idea. I just got to find it. Because what they're going to do is they're going to take this out. They're not going to, and they're going to take uh, part of the offerings for themselves that, that they're not supposed to have. I can't find the verse. That's not it. Okay, if if we were looking and comparing this with the verses that, that would have this flesh hook given reference before. Okay. Exodus 27, 3, those flesh hooks were to be made of brass. Yeah. And brass, isn't that a metal of judgment? Well, it can be. Brass can be judgment. But uh, 
that's not the only thing it represents, but okay. but yeah, it, it's it's one of the things. So this is a a a, a mitz mitzlagah flesh hook. Now you have it in ex, where do you have that that word? Exodus twenty seven three. Okay. Okay. So Exodus twenty seven. Okay. Um, and thou shalt make pans to receive the ashes, and his shovels, and his bases, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans. Yeah. For some reason, my King James concordance doesn't give that verse. <laughs> it's okay. got the right word, but it doesn't give that verse. So I don't know why. Um, so it's going to talk about it in Exodus 38, verse 3 as well. And Numbers 14, 4 talks about four, the one, four. Yeah, 414, pardon me, 414. So for some reason, my King James Concordance doesn't give me all the places that word is. That's weird. So it's going to talk about it there. So 1 Samuel, yeah, 2, verse 13 and 14. As, okay, okay I'm going to find, I found this earlier. I can't find it now. Okay, in, in Leviticus chapter 7, Verse 28, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, He that offereth the sacrifice of his peace offerings unto the Lord shall bring the oblation unto the Lord of the sacrifice of his peace offerings. His own hand shall bring the offerings of the Lord made by fire. The fat with the breast it shall it shall he bring, and the breast may be waved for a wave offering before the Lord. And the priest shall burn the fat upon the altar, and the breast shall be Aaron's and his sons. And the right shoulder shall he give unto the priest, or in heave offering of the sacrifices of your peace offerings. He among the sons of Aaron that offereth of the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right shoulder of the part. So it's here describing the parts that they're supposed to have. And, and this is, I think, what's being dealt with in 1 Samuel chapter 2. So this, this is an offering of a peace offering. And so the priests are taking whatever they want instead of what's allotted to them. That's that's what I understand. Right. Okay. And and it seems like they might be eating the fat as well that they're not burning. That's what I took from it as well. Okay. So so um now I don't know if we're going to do with this as we did with uh Judges chapter 2 where we took each of the verses as representing a year. You know, understand what I'm saying there. So I'm not really sure how we're going to do this, but well, in in these times, these the sacrifices that they had, especially at, at the tabernacle, didn't they have definite purposes to offer thanksgiving, atone for sin, or to yeah. commemorate holy days? Yeah, and my understanding, this would be a peace offering that's being dealt with here, right? Okay, because so, of what. But we'd have to go into more detail just exactly how, you know, why they're boiling it, what they're doing with this. But that's what I've gathered from a little bit of research. Not a great deal. But this is so this isn't like a sin offering or anything like that. OK, but at that point in time, yeah. when offering such a sacrifice, aren't they giving up something of their prized possessions? Aren't they giving up that? from which they they drew wealth from from their labor yes right because this is basically a way of providing for the priesthood for the levites right now of course um also so there's different views and opinions about some of this but basically the idea is when you're going to eat an animal and you and you offer it in this way you still get some of that animal back right like like some of it you take yourself, some of it the, the the offer retains, and some goes to the priest. Correct. And the 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 party that's giving the offering, yeah, they were to consume that meat within three days, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that's yeah. So they they have. So this is, I mean, there's lots of symbolism here, but. Where, where are you going with this? So what is it that you see? Well, what I'm what I'm trying to get at is that you have these these two classes 
or should mm-hmm. have these two classes. You have one that is making the offering to whom the sacrifice was a a personal situation because this would have been an animal that they had raised, that they had seen every day. Mm-hmm. Okay. For <clears throat> Ophni and Phineas, this is not personal. They've degraded, denigrated the the sacrifice. To them, it's just another source of food. Right. And then they're being picky about what they want. Right. So they're, they're living off of this without understanding the, the, the sacredness of what, what is being done. Right. Yeah. They're also ignoring the symbology of what has been done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which would be related to the sacredness of it because it deals with God's salvation to man. So they were not, Hophni and Phinehas were not having to have any emotional connection like the one that brought the sacrifice that had to watch this animal being killed. Right. So when we go back to the offering that Hannah brought for the birth of Samuel. You had commented on what a what a very expensive offering this was. Mm-hmm. But it was also a very personal offering on the part of Hannah. Mm-hmm. And so from what we're seeing here, I think we could extrapolate that Hophni and Phinehas likely did exactly the same thing at the time of this offering as they are being shown as as doing here Mm -hmm. yeah okay and 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 it reminds me my my one of my guitar students uh, the young guy who's being homeschooled now he got his uh 4-h calf i don't know if you guys have 4-h in the u.s do you know what that is no okay so it's just people in the country they 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 join a 4-H club and they they get a calf and they have to raise it and then they sell it in an auction. Yeah, it's a future farmer. It's a it's a uh, future for farmer. So something like that. Okay. Future for farmers. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. I've never heard of that. Anyway, yeah. they they have 4-H, but um. So, you know, but, you know, he's going to find, you know, raising that calf, you know, to then all of a sudden, you know, having to sell it. It's it's going to be emotional for him. I think the one thing that that farmer children raised on a farm learn is is the reality of life, the harshness of life. Um, you know, because they, you know, he, he named his uh, calf George, um, you know, so he's going to be pretty attached to that calf when he has to give it up. And so, you know, the Israelites, you know, taking a lamb into their home, you know, and then offering it up as a Passover lamb. You know, God is trying to show us that that this is real sacrifice. It's not just um, superficial. Right. And of course, Hophni and Phinehas have no really appreciation of the sacrifice that other peoples are making. And, And we saw the same in the movement, people fighting for position and using others. Right. Uh, you know, it's it's terrible when when you think about it, what was done in this movement in the name of God. That was really a desecration of of the truth. The, the, um, it was a future farms for America. That's what the name of it was. And they called it for the 4-H. OK, future farms for America, future farms. I don't know. Well, I- yeah. Well, I was in it. I was in it when I was in high school. Okay. Did you did you raise a calf? I mean I didn't uh I didn't raise them. Okay. Uh, okay. I just don't know what 4 H is. Anyway, it's it's probably we're probably, you know, going down a bunny trail here, but that's kind of interesting that, that that's connected. Uh that future for America type of name with the similar future farmers for America. 
Anyway, <clears throat> that's really kind of an aside. The main thing that we see here is in this movement, there was a lot of selfishness going on. And, and it was pretty evident. I mean, you know, people people took money that they shouldn't have taken and, and misused it and, you know, money's disappeared and and lots of jealousies and fighting for position while, while you're in a movement that's supposed to be representing God. And of course, you know, it's easy to criticize the church. It's easy to criticize other people, right? So if the enemy's out there, you know, you, you distract people or from seeing, you know, the enemy within. But we really need to focus upon our own behavior. So even in this, you know, it's not to look at you know, what the movement did and how bad they were. We need to see something about ourselves. Okay, so uh, Angela made a comment here. Um, can Ezekiel 11 have any connection? So that's the one dealing with the cauldron, you know, Jerusalem being this cauldron and flesh and flesh boasts, flesh boast. Five and 20 elder snobbery, exclusivism, murder, fear of attack, yet being haughty, finally a promise of restoration from the captivity among the penitent, God's glory departed from the temple. Yeah, I mean, definitely there can be a parallel there where we are the exclusive group, right? That exclusiveness. And, you know, I think uh, when, when Tabo moved in with me and he was part of this uh, um, email group that Parminder was a part of, you know, and I wasn't allowed to join their group because it was just for, you know, them, you know, because I said, hey, can I get the emails too? And this was when Parminder was making his, his prediction about uh, 20, um, uh, 20, 2014, right? So he made a prediction about 2014 and he made that prediction in 2012. So 2012 also has attached to it Parminder's prediction it has Tabo living with me. It has uh, the beginning of that mirror. It has that, that uh, you know, all of those things attached to it that really set in motion this whole situation with July 18th and November 9th and December 25th, 2021. Okay, so so getting back to these this flesh hook with three teeth, um, if this represents the three angels' messages, but being misused... Right. So this is a an implement that's meant to be used in the sanctuary, but it's being misused. Can we is that that fair enough? That could be a way of looking at it. Okay. Right. So it's being used for selfish reasons. Right. The, the priest takes this this stuff up and um it says in verse 15, also, before they burnt the fat, the priest servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. Now, so I'm not quite sure what this means, particularly. Are they just not, not wanting it to be boiled, but they want it to be roasted? So they want the flesh raw and they're going to roast it. They don't. Is that what they're saying? That would seem to be. Okay. But you also, when, you, when you're also looking at this, in verse 15, they wanted this flesh before the fat was being burned. Right. Yeah. So they, yeah. So hmm. it's going to take a little bit to work out all these details here. So, so I guess they would take the animal. They would um, obviously do all the skinning, the dividing of the different, uh, sections of the animal, right? I know the skin they would burn without the camp, right? Right. Without the without the sanctuary, so they had place to burn that. I believe, if I remember reading that correctly, right in the innards, right, all of the that stuff, and then, um, but the fat would be burnt, and and of course here they're going to boil it. Now some of them. When we have like a burnt offering, sometimes offerings are burnt up. Sometimes they're just roasted to be eaten, right? So there's different, different things that are done. And I'm not, I'm not an expert on, on exactly how all of this service was done, even though I've read it lots of times, but it, it is rather confusing, right? Unless you were actually seeing it happen. 
but they want to take this and roast it rather than eating it boiled, I think is what's being said in verse 15. But it's before the, they burn the fat. So, I mean, we might have to take a, a closer look at exactly how this is done to try to see exactly what, what's being described in these various offerings. But, but I want to go back to this question regarding, can we take this and use these dates or these verse numbers as years? Could we take, uh, you know, 2017, wherefore the sin of the young man was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Is there something there that could detach that to 2017? When we go to verse 18, when Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. Uh, so, so this one does have a paragraph marking there too. I thought there was another one. Uh, moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him year to year that she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli blessed Elkanah, his wife, and said, the Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And then it's going to end with 2021. The Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived. So I'm saying that this verse 12 to 21 is, even though it's in three sections, right? So there's three different sections, that it's all part of the same section. That it's it's all connected. So we're going to have in uh, 2021, 2020, and 2019, and 2018 verses that would represent a counter to what is happening previous to that. Okay, does that make sense? Or am I off track? I think we need to develop this premise a bit. Yeah. I mean, it has a logical application to it. Yeah. Yeah, there's some logical things about it. So we, of course, they have Eli's worthless sons. And so, you know, definitely they can represent this movement. But I'm saying that, you know, the idea that this 20, uh, 2012 to 2021 is represented by these verses, we would see that in 2018. Now, what's going to happen in 2018 that would be a counter to what was happening with uh, Parminder's movement. So what happens in 2018 specifically that that undoes what Parminder's movement was doing? Because we're going to have the Levitical chiasm beginning in 2018, right? So Parminder's movement, which is really the part of the movement that was interested in selfishness, I wouldn't put Jeff's part of the movement there. I don't think that Jeff exalted himself. It was part of that. I never saw it in Jeff. But in 2018, so we're going to have time setting come in, right? Correct. And we're going to have that Levitical chiasm begin uh, on June, June, yeah, June 9th, right? June 9th, 2018, then 126 days to October 13th, right? And so that's going to happen in 2018. We're going to have this introduction of November 9th and July 18, 2020. And then we're going to have uh, in 2019, it can, we would say, can is there something that we can look at in 2019 from this verse? Now, we haven't looked at the Hebrew numbers yet or any of those things. And then, of course, we would have uh, 2020 represented by uh, 2 verse 20. So this uh, this loaning of this seed, right, the woman's seed, to the Lord, right? And then in 1 Samuel 2.21, that's going to represent 2021, the end of that structure. The Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord, right? So that's what we would have to do. We would have to take this... Things that are in these verses, whether it's uh, the meanings of words, whether there's some gematria attached to it, Hebrew numbers that can give us spans of time that can connect dates together, right? Or Hebrew numbers that themselves are symbols of dates. Does that make sense? I mean, we, we could be going down, uh, you know, a bunny trail, right? N just going nowhere. But I see in this already many things that we can that that we should be able to recognize. And like 
What about three sons and two daughters? Just thinking about that. Yeah. So, I mean, three obviously representing the three angels' messages. But what about two daughters? Wise and foolish virgins, two, two groups. Yeah, there's two groups that still come out of that, right? Out of that at the end of that uh, December 25th, 2021. We want to put it that way. The wise and the foolish. There's still two classes that have to be separated again. That's Brother, possible. Brother Theodore. Yeah. I have to uh, tell you, it, the four H's is, is talking about head, heart, hands, and health. Head, heart, hands, and health? Yes, that's what the four H's mean. Yeah, yeah, I, I knew it was something like that. It, yes, it, it's a youth organization. Yeah. I was in it at one time. Yeah, okay, so they have that in the U.S. as well. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's going to be lots of, it's, it's going to take a little bit of time to structure this. Now we do have sort of three sections as well, right? In this and, and how we would understand that. So we got uh, 20 to 21 is a section, right? Those two verses are a section. And, and then we have 18 and 19 is a section, right? So they got a paragraph marking there. And then, uh, 12 to 17 is a section. So we got three sections and they can represent three parts of this movement, three, three different histories. Now, um, so we're going to have in this movement, if we go back to 2012, so what's happening in the movement at that time? Now I come in the movement 2010, but we're going to be marking 2012. What, what's occurring in the movement at this time? What's the underlying issue Newport and what had occurred in casting people out okay yeah so so we're going to see this issue with the 2520 this is where it's going to uh, come about right uh, you're going to have the, the Newport issue but we also have these other groups that have joined the movement previously and there's going to be a lot of unrest that is disaffection with Jeff's leadership. And and this is kind of seen in, in 2012. We have a camp meeting in Alberta. On October 5th, I'm going to present in the morning. So that's the first presentation I do in the movement, you know, in any sort of official capacity. And um, we have uh, Jamal. Jamal Sankey is going to be at this camp meeting, as well as Roland Temple and Tabo and me were the speakers. And Jamal makes pretty evident his desire to have people send their tithe to him instead of to Jeff, right? So there's a meeting that he has on Sabbath in the afternoon where he's talking. It's not an official meeting. He's just talking with a bunch of people and saying, you need to send your tithe uh, to me and to um, Emiliano and, and these other people, not to Jeff. Jeff has too much money, right? In, in 2013, we have a camp meeting in Alberta, a bigger one. So that one was just a weekend one. It's the Thanksgiving weekend in Canada, which is October, not November, and uh, which is coming up here in Canada. Our weekend here is the Thanksgiving weekend. Um, and then in 2013, we had the camp meeting in August, and Jamal Sankey was also a speaker at that camp meeting. Uh, but he wasn't there when Jeff was there. So Jeff, so Jamal came for the first half. And when he left, Jeff showed up, I think, on the Wednesday. And then Jeff presented and left um, Sunday. And Roland was presenting messages about how, basically, not directly, but he was talking about narcissism, and he was pointing at Jeff. Basically, I didn't recognize it at the time, but most people picked up on his hints. I, I'm just a little bit naive to do that. Uh, but Jamal was really quite clear about uh, the problems with Jeff. In 2014, they're going to have this letter that they put out uh, where they um, basically oppose Jeff openly, and, and that's going to sever uh, the movement so that all of these other groups that had joined with Jeff now had left just Future for America by itself. So we're going to have these various divisions. 
right? And, and we actually connect the prediction that Arminder made in 2012 with 2014. That is, what he was really predicting was something within the movement, we find out later. And then, uh, so when we go through these different years, 2015, uh, they're still going to be dealing with the aftermath of that division within the movement. In 2014, of course, in the fall, I do my presentations in Arkansas, the first presentations in Arkansas on biblical chronology. And I did them in Alberta as well. In 2015, the movement is going to be uh, looking to make a prediction. They don't have time attached to it yet. In 2016, we, we complete the line, so we're going to find out about the midnight cry and um, and and midnight. By 2016, we have the line structured, which becomes the main pattern of 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law, being April 19th, the first day of the first month, July uh, 21st being midnight, uh, August 15th being the midnight cry, and October 22nd being the Sunday law. And and this is the basic pattern that, that we understand now. That's the unsealing of the seven thunders, the understanding of Millerite history, which then unfolds in, in a remarkable way in 2017. So in 2017, we're going to have, uh, that's when they're going to begin their organization, right? They're going to have their first organizational meetings, I believe. And, um, and it's that time when there is this counter message beginning, but it's going to be really evident in 2018 when I give uh, a study dealing with um, the significance of October 13th and its connection to 9-11-9, uh, um, right, to November 9th, right? So, so that this message that Samuel would be this message that's going to counteract um, the work of Hoffna and Finehas. Does it seem reasonable? I mean, obviously we have to delve into more detail and we have to put this on a line. And then, of course, after that, we have Eli rebuking his sons, which would be obviously the failure of the prediction and dealing with uh, our history presently. Now, obviously we got uh, 23, 24, 25, how many verses? 26. So whether we would just go up to 2025, you know, we, we if we're going to have each of these verses represent years in a very strict literal sense, or whether this is going to go up to 2029, 20, 2030. Okay. So there's going to be lots of detail. So I think there's still going to be more, but there's a lot there to read. I don't know if we can read all that. But there's probably lots of messages there for us that things that we have to pay attention to. There was quite a bit in the in those uh, 27 pages on 230. Okay. There, there is a lot of different things that are being said. Yeah. So so that's all on 230, and then you know. Then we're getting, it's going to go all the way up to, I mean, I could have just looked at the Bible. So it's going to, there's going to be six more verses or seven more verses, I guess. Six, six more. So 231 to 236. Okay. So, so we're going to have to sort through this. It's, it's not going to be easy. And, you know, I will read over all of those sections and maybe bring out some of the highlights because I'm pretty sure there would be lots of repetition in those 27 pages, you say? Right. Yeah, because there's 53 pages in this document. <laughs> and Kelly, do you have a comment? Now, of course, 2030, if we took that as a year, that's uh, one of the, that's the last date we have as a symbol. But then we could take, you know, th that Samuel is is this message, right, That that's going to counteract what Parminder was doing. That is understanding our lines correctly and and the significance of time setting. Well, definitely could Eli also represent JB being too lenient with Parminder and Tess or now that's a good question. Uh, just dealing with with Jeff. Uh, too lenient. 
I, I think the problem with Jeff is is def, definitely he was manipulated by people. You know, this is my assessment. So my assessment for whatever it's worth, you know, it might not be worth anything. But my view is that Jeff valued characteristics in people based upon his experience in the world that he came from and that he didn't value uh, the correct characteristics in individuals, which is why he always trusted the wrong person. So what would those characteristics be that we see in people like Parminder or Mark Bruce or others that, that Jeff valued? Because I always wonder about it. Like, I always wonder why he, he trusts the wrong people. Any thoughts on that? That's something I'm going to have to consider through the day. I mean, we all I have think our... Part of it is they yeah. appear to be more more or learned. Okay, learned. Um, more uh, more or of, of an oracle skill than Jeff. I think that was that that was a factor. But I remember, like, what comes to me right now, sitting across the table from a, from a from a par parminder, and he was saying, um, uh, this year a lot of these people are going to be dead. And I think that was in 2017 or 18. And I just looked at him shocked. I mean, I was I was still quite new, and I was like, what in the world are you talking? About? Well, see, I would say and, that, you know, like I couldn't understand him. Like, why would he say that? I don't know. I, I just saw that Jeff tended to. Um, yeah, I should have asked him that and that, explored me. Because people are ambitious. I think he likes ambition. He admires ambition, which which is understandable, right? You know, people who accomplish things and do things and have personal ambitions or striving or, or, or it, it makes sense from an organizational point of view, you know, people that get things done, that's who he's going to put his trust in, but not understanding the motives that that person has. But, but I could be wrong, right? But that's just my perspective because they were all very aggressive people. Yeah. But, yeah. So I don't know, but um, anyway, we're going to have to come back to this tomorrow and so we've got Wednesday and Thursday this week still to look at this. But I don't think we're going to solve all the problems here yet. Like, we're not going to get this all figured out and on a line, I don't think, right away. But I want people to think about it and and uh, see if this proposition makes any sense. A any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I was just referring to the eating the flesh, uh, eating raw flesh uh, when Saul ate. Ban folks, ban, ban his army from eating. And then they went crazy. They, yeah, they're not going to eat raw flesh. Sheep, cattle, whatever, I mean, just eating them raw. I don't, I don't the think they, they don't eat raw flesh. They just want to roast it. They don't want it boiled. Okay. Cause in, in Saul's time, they, they were. So that kind of stood out mm -hmm. to me. Okay. Okay. Anyway, let's uh, close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just ask for your care today. And thank you for the things that you show us from your word. Help us to continue to learn and grow. We pray for one another. And uh, help us with our plans that they may be according to thy will. And help us to be attentive uh, to the little things in life and to trust in you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.